Today on Locked On Canadians, we recap that overtime win against the Arizona Coyotes, and then we talk about P.K. Subban, a homecoming and an honoring in Montreal. How does that make us feel? Finally, is it acceptable to tank? There is no honor in it. Is there? Is it an acceptable thing to do? We talk about that in our final segment. That's all coming up on today's Locked On Canadians. Locked On Canadians, your daily podcast on the Montreal Canadiens. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to episode 750 of Locked On Canadians. We thank you for making us your first listen of the day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. And if you see us looking younger in the next two segments of this episode, it is because one of us is technically actually younger in the next two segments um, of the episode. We are recording this first segment right after the game, but we pre-recorded the other two segments. And it happens to be Scott Matla's birthday right now. So since we recorded before midnight for those two segments, he's literally younger in the later episodes of this episode. Anyway, happy birthday, Scott. How are you? Uh, I felt a lot younger before this game started, and then I felt my life force slowly being drained out of me as the Canadians got speed bagged for most of the game by a team playing in a college hockey arena. But they won in overtime. Of course, it was Mike Hoffman for maximum hilarity. I will take the two points and just get the hell out of Arizona and go on to wherever. Oh, they're playing Dallas next. <laughs> Maybe maybe stay in Arizona for a day or two. I, I, I don't know. Uh, it's over. It's done with. Let us never speak of this game again. Well, we kind of have to speak about it for the first segment, though. After couple this things. segment is over, we can never speak of it again. <laughs> hand, right, gestures. Couple, couple of hand gestures. You can tell we're really loopy. This is, this, is, this is like, you know, it's sad girl hours, but for whatever reason, we're loopy. Um, real quick, I want to talk about a couple of things. One, um, the Canadians did not play well. Uh, the overtime was interesting. Samuel Montambo was both good and bad in parts of this game. I would say mostly good. Mostly good. Um, the Canadians really... Good. <laughs> yeah. The Canadians really need to figure out how to support him and Jake Allen. They also really need to figure out how to score goals. Uh, they also... One thing that I noticed was... I don't understand what the philosophy behind the ice time is on this team now. And I know I'm getting a little bit frustrated. Uh, I'm looking at the power play units. I don't like them. I don't like the deployment in general. I have question marks about the deployment in general of this team. I would like some explanations. I would like to figure out what the philosophy is here. Because it seemed, especially at the beginning of the year, that the Canadians had an identity and a philosophy. And now it's just kind of like, why are they playing that guy so much? Why aren't they playing this guy enough? Why aren't they playing this guy? You know? So I, I just, it's confusing to me. And later on in the show, we talk about tanking on purpose and losing on purpose. And if that's a thing, or if there's, you know, if that's acceptable at all, I don't think the Canadians are tanking on purpose, but I think that the Canadians are kind of out of ideas. And I don't think that they necessarily uh, have, a plan going forward and I know we all want a higher draft pick I know we've all kind of given up on the idea of the Canadians getting anywhere this season they're already at the bottom of the Atlantic what more what more can we want I just feel like I would like to see a little bit more coherence to some of the deployment particularly in the defensive end I have three thoughts that uh permeated my brain for most of this game Anthony Richard got promoted to Uri Slavkovsky's spot in the second, third line there, and Slavkovsky was demoted to the fourth line. And if this season is about building for the next one, I get that Anthony Richard played well tonight. Led the team in expected goals, led the team in Corsi 4 in his limited ice time. Great. I'm happy that he found that kind of success here. But you've seen that Slavkovsky was playing very well in the group that he was in. I, 
I get that maybe it's just for the win, but that's not a thing that should be permanent. You should not be calling up Anthony Richard to replace your first overall pick in this lineup for a long-term solution. You're supposed to be working on developing this player right now. And my next thought is we can't do Josh Anderson on the Suzuki Caulfield line anymore. The only time that line showed any little bit of life besides Caulfield's opening goal, which was all from Caden Gooley's efforts is once they took Anderson off that line and moved Kirby Doc back up there. Just don't, it doesn't work. Stop trying to make fetch happen. We have to stop trying this. And just across the board, like the defensive zone coverage tonight, bad clearing attempts, bad reads, just I, the only group that I didn't think was terrible was Jordan Harris and Jonathan Kovacevic. But at the same time, None of the groups really looked good. And by the numbers, Edmondson and Gooley had a seemingly pretty solid game overall, which I think the biggest thing out of all this is that Arbor Jack and Chris Weidman doesn't work. A lot like Josh Anderson on the top line doesn't work. These are little fixes, and this is your time to try new things. You know these things do not work. You know what things do work. Do not go back to the things that do not work because you want to try new things. Try literally anything else. I'm not put saying put Arbor that, Jack Eye on the Suzuki line. I mean, put Chris Weidman on the Suzuki line for all I care. <laughs> the time, anyways. Like, I'm glad they won because this isn't a game they should be losing to a team below them in the standings. The way they got to it is through moments of individual brilliance not through cohesive team efforts. And that's where there's a problem because their last couple games have been rough individual efforts, not a cohesive team one. And I want to see more of that. If you're going to lose, go down as a team and playing well, don't lose because Cole Caulfield couldn't score three goals in a game to get you there. That's um, outside of that. It's like I said, you just pack it up and move on. Samuel Montembeau is not paid enough. Apparently, stellar game from him he was yeah I, I said he was bad i feel bad for saying that because he wasn't really he like he had some moments where he showed flashes of like mm, i don't know Shakiness. about this yes but then like he just dialed it in he was the only reason it wasn't like a two nothing game a couple minutes in he was very very good tonight and it's like we talked about in our previous episode it's okay to give him more starts and give jake allen some rest yes you might as well see what he can do and he's playing well Reward him for good play. That's what the season should be about. I absolutely agree. In the meantime, we're going to be back. I'm going to have slightly flatter hair. Scott is literally going to be a year younger. That's all coming (laughs) up (laughs) in our next segment. But first, as you know, this episode is brought to you by BetOnline. BetOnline BetOnline.net is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there from pro football to college bowl season to basketball and the World Cup that was just over. We've got it all at BetOnline.net. If you love sports podcasts, you can even find those at BetOnline as well. You know you love sports podcasts because you're listening to this one right now. We're always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting info. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet online where the game starts. All right. So, Scott, there has been some big news in Canadians land. And your reaction to this was, I need to quote you on this. Enough salt from this will keep Montreal snow free for a decade. So the news, obviously, <laughs> was that P.K. Subban is returning to Montreal to be honoured by the Montreal Canadiens before the Predators game in January. Now, the timing of this is a bit surprising. Uh, not in that the, you know, P.K. Subban is now retired from, from, from play. This is kind of a time to do it. However, they just announced it and it's happening so soon. I think that's what was surprising. There didn't seem to be any foreshadowing or lead up to this that would have made us guess that this was happening. Uh, It is interesting. And I think that there's been a lot of debate about this in my friend circles since, since the news was announced the afternoon that we're recording this is a lot of people are like, well, what if people boo him? You know, like he has such a complicated legacy in Montreal. And I, I don't necessarily think he'll be booed. I think I think the cheers will drown out the booze because you kind of have to remember that 
P.K. Subban is not just a player in Montreal. He's somebody who did a lot for charity in the Children's Hospital. He, he had a lot of visibility in Montreal as just like a, you know, a celebrity around town. But he used it for good. And I think, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot to be said about him. But I think on that aspect alone, I think fans and Montrealers appreciate what he is and what he brought to the city. Scott, what are your thoughts? Well, I thought with this is that it's a huge, huge thing from the regime to do this. Because if this was the old one, this would not be a thing that is happening. And I don't really think that's up for debate at this point. And I'm trying to think of the last like non-Jersey retirement player that they honored. And I'm pretty certain besides uh, Weber and Blacanitz's thousandth games, which were active players, it was Saku Koivu who was honored as a former Canadians player after he had retired uh, and he had come back to Montreal. And I remember because I cried deeply listening to his speech there. And it's a huge deal because P.K. Subban does mean a lot to a lot of different people in Montreal. And as Mark Dumont put it on Twitter, his last game as a Canadian was him getting taken out on a stretcher after Alexi Emelin accidentally hit him in the head with his butt uh, on a check. That's not how a guy like P.K. Subban, who is a, a, a hero for many Canadians fans, for the, that generation of Habs fans who grew up watching him be a superstar, winning the Norris, and being that guy on defense, I'm extremely excited to see him back in Montreal. He's going to have a, it's going to be a long speech. Just it's going to be a long speech. It wouldn't be PK Subban if he didn't thank everybody and talk about, you know, all the important people that he's met and people that he's worked with. And for me, I'm very excited for this because I'm also very curious which, you know, former teammates of his, are they going to have for like video messages and other stuff like, you know, like we said, Thomas Placanitz, you know, in one of my favorite clips from 24CH when they were waiting to find out who made the Olympic roster, Placanitz knows he's making the Czech Republic. PK walks in and Placanitz looks at him and goes, you make Team Canada, you POS. I knew they would take, you, you know, a bum like you. I'm so curious to see what happens. And you know, Carey Price will be there. You absolutely know Carey Price will be one of the guys who will probably greet him before he gets on the ice there because they're best friends which is a very weird contrast of personalities. But this is something I can't wait for. It's going to be an emotional night, a very emotional night across the board. And picking the Predators is just, you know, it gives Predators fans a chance to, you know, also, you know, say thank you to P.K. Subban if they are in attendance there because he did help lead them to a Stanley Cup final uh, when he was there after the trade. I'm really glad that, you know, whoever made this call, whether it was Hughes and Gordon or Molson and just the team in general, I'm really glad they're doing this because old wounds can be healed if you, you know, take the steps to do so. And if they're willing to let bring PK back and give him this honor, which is not a very common thing for Canadians, uh, the Montreal Canadiens, it's progress forward in all facets of the organization. And yes, there's still work to be done, but it's P.K. Subban. How can you not be excited about P.K.'s return to Montreal? Not as a player, not as a coach, not as, you know, just someone at like an event. He's going there to be honored as his time as a Hab, as a Montreal Canadian, as one of the most exciting players in franchise history. It's not hard to feel a little bit emotional about that. Yeah, and I think one thing that, like, we kind of forget is that P.K. Subban was the reason that he was so Montreal is that he grew up in Toronto as a Montreal Canadiens fan, a diehard Montreal Canadiens fan. His entire family were Canadiens fans. And then he got picked by the Canadiens. There was, he got picked in the second round. He, you know, he definitely overperformed his draft, uh, draft rank, I guess. Um, and he had a lot of skill. He had a lot of talent, but he also had a lot of personality. And I think something that we don't talk about enough is that how few people of color or specifically black people there are in the NHL and how much scrutiny they're under all of the time and how, you know, s somebody like Patrick Kane showboating is, is good. Somebody like PK Subban showboating is not. And we say it about Cole Caulfield now. This is a kid who loves playing hockey. He enjoys being a Montreal Canadian. He relishes how good he is at hockey. We excuse it and love it for Cole Caulfield. 
But when P.K. Subban was doing things like that, just having that exuberant attitude of like just enjoying to play playing the game, he was getting a lot of criticism for it. And so there's a there's a very complicated, painful part of his legacy in Montreal because the thing is, like you see, for example, somebody like Brady Kachak, right? He's a clown. But like Senators fans love it. The rest of us call him a clown, but Senators fans love it, right? For P.K. Subban, it was everybody else plus Canadians fans. And that was really difficult to swallow. Not all Canadians fans, but some Canadians fans. So there is like a little bit of a tough legacy. And then he was traded away just before his no trade clause kicked in. He was traded away. And, you know, we talked a lot about like who won that trade and what ended up happening. And yes, you know, the Canadians got also got to go to the Stanley Cup final and Shea Weber, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, this was somebody that had signed on for a long future in Montreal that got traded away. And there was a lot of hurt. I remember he was invited to do a Just for Laughs gala that following uh, summer. And he like his entire bit was about being traded away. Uh, so, you know, like there was a lot of hurt there. And, and I know for a fact, because I know people that work there, he is much beloved at the children's hospital. He is, you know, he's somebody that brought a lot. He's somebody that brought a lot to Montreal in terms of charity and the charitable endeavors and things like that. So like, I hope that the good outweighs the bad in the reception when he's here. I hope that the cheers drown out the booze. And I, like, he was one of my favorite players. He still is one of my favorite players. You know, when he was in his prime, there was, like, th there were few things that were as exciting and fun to watch. Just, like, remember him with Markov. I think that, you know, P.K. Subban needs to be appreciated. He didn't bring a Stanley Cup to Montreal. But, like, if we hold not bringing a Stanley Cup to Montreal against players, like, there's Saku that would be less beloved. There's Shea Weber that would be less beloved. There, there's so many people that, like, you know, even Markov that would be less beloved. Carey Price that would be less beloved. So, I think that, you know, whatever the circumstances of his leaving are, and I do know that, you know, much was made of like, you know, Brendan Gallagher saying some comments about him after a game or whatever. But while they were here, yeah, they got into some altercations, but apparently they're friends. Like, probably not best friends, but apparently they got along, right? Like when they were teammates, they, they there, there were skirmishes and stuff. Like people, people sometimes fight in workplaces. It happens. Um, and I just, I think that like that kind of stuff is overblown and that what he brought is under it, is underappreciated. So I hope that this honoring, like I would never say they need to raise his number to the rafters or anything like that. No, that's not, that's not something, but like to honor him as somebody who's, you know, who brought a lot to the city of Montreal, I think, I think it's worth it. I think, I think it's a great idea and I'm glad the Canadians are doing it. Scott, any parting thoughts? No, I think that I think covers everything. I think that place is going to be deafening. I mean, people are going to boo because that's what people do. They pay the ticket. They're allowed to do what they want, but it's going to be loud there. It's going to be real, real loud there. And I, I good. Give him the cheers he deserves. Uh, give, you know, it, it, I'm glad they're doing this now before it's passed by too long, you know, celebrate them while you can. And I am very excited for this when that comes in January. Me too. In the meantime, we did get a mailback question um, that we wanted to turn into a segment. And then there was another mailback question that was asked later than that that we kind of wanted to combine. And we want to ask about, is it worth tanking? And that's all coming up in our next segment here on Montreal Canadian. Locked on Canadians. <laughs> Listen, we are recording this before the Coyotes game, but it feels like after the Coyotes game. That's how tired we are. Um, we were about to do an actual topic that, you know, needs our <laughs> thought and not just you laughing at me, Scott. Um, we got a mailback question that I kind of wanted to turn into a segment. And it comes from Charles. So Charles asks, so I'm, I'm going to read the whole, this is via Twitter DM. And then we're going to ask the next mailback question that I was talking about. We can kind of combine this into a segment. I'm a brand new listener to Locked On Canadians. I love the show and both of you. Well, thank you. I've lived in the Tampa Bay region since 2003, so it's been a very interesting ride being exposed to the exciting Lightning and the current Habs coach. My love for the Habs have never diminished, has never diminished, but I have to say that all this tank talk is so foreign to me. Is it now acceptable for teams to underperform for a better draft pick? So this is one part of the question. And the other somewhat related question is our, from our friend, uh, Lenny. 
And um, the question is, given the Habs have an abundance of talented prospects at their disposal this year, what's your thoughts on playing the kids? I know common thinking is not overwhelming the youngsters. However, all of these players have been the best of all, best all of their young lives. They thrive on being the go-to guy on their teams and have excelled at that. Perhaps stapling them to the bench and or giving them minimal ice time in a fourth line role is not the best means of development. I'd like to see the prospects used more. And while I know a high salary established player might not like third or fourth line ice time, perhaps they might be okay with giving 100% and escalating their trade value. The future happens quick, so let the kids play. That's why we have coaches to help them work through mistakes they will inevitably make. So these are two sides of the same coin, right? When you're saying, is it acceptable to underperform for a better draft pick? I think that if you're trying to lose on purpose, there isn't a whole lot of honor in that. And I think that when you're dealing with competitive athletes or coaches like Martin St. Louis, you can't really make them lose on purpose. Like, I really would like to see in the office, you know, you call Martin St. Louis in and say, start losing games. How's he going to react to that? So I think that there is such a thing as organically tanking by having a bad roster. That's the only, that's really the only way you can do it. And then if you do organically tank, you get the benefit of having a higher draft pick, but you also get the benefit of what Lenny's talking about. And you get to play your kids. Like he said, like somebody like Yuri Slavkovsky, like that, I think like to me, and, and particularly the part about the fourth line kind of made me feel that that's, that's, that's the, genesis of that question is playing um Slavkovsky in in a lower uh you know lower pairing or sorry lower um line than he should I think that it's not acceptable to purposely lose but I think that it is acceptable to put yourself in a position where you have the benefit of being able to play your youngsters and give them that NHL experience allow them the chance to make mistakes, allow them to fit into a lineup as opposed to just being the go-to guy to kind of like create it into a system or put it into a system, but also at the end of the year, get a good draft pick. I agree. Like, I don't think anyone set, I mean, the Arizona Coyotes this year might be, and I know I'm saying this before we've recorded the actual Blackhawks. recap, the Blackhawks too. Yeah. There are teams that are that are straight up attempting to be bad. Uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs did it. Uh, the year they ended up with Austin Matthews, like that was a team. The Sabers did it in the McEichel year, where they legitimately got a goalie in a trade. Turned out he was playing too well and traded him immediately because he was winning too many games. The Canadians aren't quite in organic territory because they still have a roster that is not very good across the board. There are a lot of bright spots compared to last year and are getting brighter as we speak. But there's still a lot of veteran weight on this team that guys like Jesse Ullinen are not playing. A Raphael Harvey Pinard is not playing. Younger guys you want to see in the lineup, and they are working towards getting them there. Ken Hughes has made it very clear he is listening to offers on veteran players and will move them when the deal is right. He's not sitting idly on his hands, so he is trying to make that forward progress. It's just a matter of needing that dance partner for that and getting to that next step of the rebuild, which is, okay, which of the kids actually fit in this lineup? Which of these kids are NHL ready or can be with an expanded role here in figuring that out next? And I think next year is going to be a big kids year. Uh, I do think there's going to be some guys that are moved out. You're going to see, I, I, I swear, I think we're going to see Owen Beck and potentially Philip Mashar in the NHL lineup for bits and pieces, even um, depending on how their camps go. Maybe whoever they pick in the first round in the 2023 draft, uh, either pick in the 2023 draft, you know, guys like Jesse Ullin and or some, you know, and who comes out of left field in this organization, Joshua Wash should push for an NHL spot next year. He's done with the QMJHL at this point. Riley Kidney will also be turning pro. You'll see someone like Jared Davidson make that push there. And that enters their next step there. They're far ahead of the curve here because they got better results this year and they've gotten big performances from guys they wanted to. That's a great building block. That's fantastic. Now build on top of that because you've got to get these younger guys in the lineup, but you can't just make Josh Anderson. You just can't make Mike Hoffman or Yol Armia disappear. It's not Roby Dot Island anymore. They, you know, you can't just make people disappear. I understand wanting to get these guys, the younger guys in there, and I do too. Like I've watched them cook in the AHL and watched them play in, you know, other leagues. I want to see them at that next level too. But there's also a patience involved with this. The Canadians are not outrightly making a bad roster. 
They're not Arizona. They are not the Blackhawks. They are not the Leafs of the, you know, Austin Matthews year or the Buffalo Sabres trading goalies because they were too good. But they're not there next, that next step, which is we want to push for a playoff spot. They're still, you know, two steps below that. And the next one is get those young guys in the lineup and let them season and let them grow. And I think that tanking, you know, inorganically, mean like we're just stripping assets, we're stripping the sucker bear and burning it down. I think there can be a difference between burning it down and playing young guys and burning it down and keeping three guys you can't trade because their contracts are bad and surrounding them with, you know, remember some dudes, dudes from the NHL here. And I'm actually liking the direction the Canadians are going. It's going to be a struggle because we've seen the good and they're still bad to come though. And I think this is a really strong indication of Kent Hughes and everyone adhering to the same plan. Yes. And there's just one thing that I want to say is that in the comments for yesterday's episode, there were some people questioning kind of Martin St. Louis as a coach, which I think it's legitimate to ask the question because he is an inexperienced coach and somebody suggested, you know, have, have somebody support him, like, because he's not getting support from the guys he has now, Burroughs, uh, Robida, whatever. Um, I do think that it is his first full season as an NHL coach and he does need to learn from mistakes. I just, for me, it's very much the way that I look at the players. I also look at Martin St. Louis in the same way. Is he improving over time? I don't think it's reasonable to expect him to be an amazing coach right away, but most coaches that you see in the NHL cut their teeth in lower leagues and he hasn't done that. He hasn't had the opportunity to do that. So this is where he's going to make his mistakes. The question is, is he going to get better? And I don't think he's a terrible coach. I think he's bringing out a lot in a roster that's not great. Um, I think, you know, you look at you look at the defense and stuff like that. But I do agree when people say that he is an inexperienced coach. Sometimes he makes decisions that, like, highlight his inexperience. I would agree with you there. I just, for me, like, I think that, you know, the person who suggested he needs more veteran support, I, I like that. And I also think that, you know, it's going to take some time and he's going to learn along with the players. Like, if he, at the end of the year, like, he hasn't learned from any of the mistakes that he's making in this part of the slump. You know, the November, December, like, yuckiness, January, February sometimes is like that, too. If he's not learning from that, I'll be a little bit worried. But he's still got some time, right? And this roster is going to change dramatically over the course of the next few months, whether it's trade deadline or draft or people making the NHL next season. So I'm not too, too nervous. But I do want to – I did want to kind of bring that up. So – I do think that, you know, I, and I, I really appreciate that there's debate about it. Some people are disagreeing. People disagreed with us. People disagreed in general. I, I appreciate that there's a lot of debate. Like, it's fun to have these things to talk about. Because if you're looking at the power play, it's not fun. <laughs> it's not fun to watch. And in the meantime, we will allow you to get on with your day. And remember that you can subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcast. We have a special uh, mailbag episode for tomorrow's episode. Uh, once again, happy birthday to my co-host, Scott. <laughs> and uh, don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube. You can find us on Twitter at LO underscore Canadians. You'll find me at The Active Stick. You'll find him at Scott Matlock. Please be nice. It is his birthday. Do not yell at him for posting gifts. Thank you so much for listening. We will talk to you tomorrow.